Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon to you, wherever you are in the world. I am Tigris Osborne. I'm the executive director of NAFA, the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. Welcome to the NAFA webinar series, where we are joined today by our friends from Little People of America. We're going to get into the panel and presentation from them in just one second. But for those of you who are new to us, um, and for those of you who need a little refresher, just a little bit about NAFA. We are a 54-year-old civil rights organization, the uh, oldest documented organization in the world, working towards equality at every size. Um, we work to change perceptions of fat and to end size discrimination through education, advocacy, and support. We do that through virtual programming, like the event that you are here for today, and through lots of other kinds of activities uh, across the United States and, and uh, across the internet. Um, so we welcome friends from all over the world to participate with us um, in these educational and social opportunities. Uh, we have still many more virtual events coming up for the end of 2024. You can always find out what is coming from NAFA by checking our website at naafa.org. And you can also um, follow us on your favorite social media. We are NAFA official on most of the things that you might be on. Um, we're particularly active on, um, on Instagram, so please do join us if you're there. And... Um, and we are joined today, um, as always, by our friends from Pro Bono ASL. Uh, today's interpreters are Selena and Maribel, uh, so Selena and Marbella, and um, and we uh, we love the work of Pro Bono ASL. Um, their important important work for accessibility. Um, even though their name is Pro Bono, we want you to know that we do compensate our interpreters in order to help support them in offering those pro bono services to others who need them. We are able to compensate our interpreters, to um, compensate guests on our uh, various programming, um, and to uh, do all of the important work that we do through the support of people just like you. So uh, we encourage you to follow us and to give to NAFA at whatever level feels meaningful and significant to you. Um, you can do that on our giving page, again, at naafa.org, in that case, backslash give. Um, with no further ado, I would like to get into our content for today, and I'm going to introduce you um, to my uh, to my colleague uh, Samantha, who is the a member of the board of the directors and is the advocacy director for Little People of America. And Samantha is going to introduce everybody else and um, and uh, get us started off. Samantha. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So wonderful to be here. And thank you to NAFA for having us. Uh, we're really, really excited to present our organization to all of you and hopefully leave with uh, some more allies. So I am Sam, Samantha. Uh, I am based in Canada, in Winnipeg, Canada, and I'm the advocacy director for Little People of America. And I'm also president of Little People of Manitoba, so our local province up here. Um, I have been a member of the board for almost a year and a half and just, you know, love it. I'm all about advocacy. All things advocacy make me happy. And um, hopefully we'll get to share some cool advocacy things with you over the next hour. I'm going to introduce my best friend since we were eight years old, president of LPA, Eileen Norman, as she rolls her eyes at me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Eileen, gonna introduce you, and then um, and then we'll introduce some of our other friends here too. Excellent, thank you, thank you, Samantha, my best friend since I was eight years old. Appreciate it. Um, I am Eileen Norman. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I yes, I am currently the current president of LPA. Um, have been serving in this role since uh, just the beginning of this summer. So that's. Uh, so new and fresh, but I was on the board um, in years past and got to return in this in this role. Um, I've been a member of LPA my entire life. Um, as one thing that's uh, a little different than the than the other folks that are on the call with me is that both of my parents uh, have dwarfism, so I inherited that from them, um, and I actually inherited both forms of dwarfism. We'll talk about that. Uh, about um, different types of dwarfism a little bit later in the slide. But yeah, I, you know, I live in San Francisco um, with my partner and our two fur children. Um, and I'm happy to be here and happy 
I've, it's been enjoyable to learn more about this organization um, and the parallels that we that we have in the work that we're doing, um, and also get to learn about the differences that we get to grow from in learning about different worlds. So appreciate that. I will now pass it on to Deb. Thank you, Eileen. Um, I'm Deb Hemsel. I am the executive director of LPA. I uh, have been in this role with LPA since uh, early 2018, I think. So this is my fifth year here. Um, you will notice of all of our panel panelists that are here from LPA today, I am uh, the only average height person. Um, they are. They all have dwarfism, and I, I am an average height parent of a child who has dwarfism. Um, our, our membership does, uh, you know, we not only support the, the person who has dwarfism, but also, you know, the families um, as well. And uh, we, um, just a little bit of background on me. My, uh, my son is adopted from China. And uh, my husband's brother actually has dwarfism as, as well. So um, I've been very familiar with the LPA family in the, at the local level because my husband, as um, average height sibling to his brother, kind of grew up in the LPA family locally. And when we had the opportunity to adopt our son from China, it seemed like a natural fit. And um, my son came home from China um, uh not knowing that he had dwarfism, which was kind of interesting. They had never told him that he had dwarfism. And um, so it, it kind of immediately when we brought him home was important to us to get him involved in LPA and uh, see, let him see others that had dwarfism. Um, he was actually told in China that um, he needed to come to the United States because as parents, we would help him grow taller. And um, he had a lot of uh, frustration built up and a lot of anger that uh, he was not growing taller when he came over to the States. But um, our very first visit to a an LPA event, I was actually had just been um, hired as the, the um, executive director of LPA and we went to a local event. And my son went very angry that I made him go with me. He didn't want to be around other people that uh, look like him. He didn't want to to connect with um, with LPA. And uh, we had a, a a group of individuals there that run a kind of a, a a teen meeting for kids. And they invited him to go up and have lunch with them. And he begrudgingly went because I kind of, as the mom, kind of nudged him a little bit and said, you need to go. Um, and I and I felt like we were going to pay for that because he was very angry at me for making him go. But he came back out of that one hour later, bouncing with, with joy and with kind of this excitement about everything he had talked about up there and everything he, you know, all these things that he now found out he could do and it was okay. And could he go with me to the national conference? And I watched a child who was just filled with anger and and frustration spend 30 to 45 minutes, well, actually probably an hour, with others in the LPA organization and came out a totally different perspective on his in on his future and on who he was and started accepting who he was. And um so as we kind of talk about our why, as why, you know, why maybe we do what we do. Uh, that kind of empowered me in my mind to, to do whatever I could to make LPA as successful as it could be for anybody else who might be experiencing the same kind of um, situation with, with their child or with themselves trying to find a place to, to get that support and uh, that needed, um, uh, you know, um, security of, uh, and, and sense of, of uh, self-worth that I think my son walked out of that LPA meeting with. So I watched it happen in about an hour and it was kind of amazing. So that's kind of why I'm here and, um, and I love the organization. And so that's just a little bit about me handing it off to uh, Rachel. Hi everybody, I'm Rachel Keller. Um, I am the membership director on the board of directors for Little People of America. And um, just to give you a quick visual description, I have uh, I am a white dwarf fat woman. Um, you can see my head and shoulders with uh, gray blonde hair 
um, uh, green shawl and turquoise earrings. Um, I use, and I'm coming uh, from Western Massachusetts, which is the Nipmuc and the Tumcuck lands. And in addition to being on the board, I'm also a licensed clinical social worker and um, with a private practice uh, specializing in sex therapy. Um, and I'm really interested in the intersections of uh, sex and disability. And so um, I'm really looking forward uh, to talking with everybody, uh, both through our presentation and um, and also in questions afterwards. And I'm a lifetime member of LPA, uh, but newly to the board as of this summer. So thank you so much for having us. And uh, Julie, come on down. Hi, thank you, Rachel. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, Nafa. It's such a joy to be in this intersection of two communities that I are so you know that I'm a part of and are a big part of my life. Um, I am um, a middle-aged white woman sitting in a car, uh, brown hair with turquoise uh, stripes, and. Um, I'm a little person and also a fat person. I call myself a, uh, uh oh, um, oh my goodness, um, a small fat, and I'm kind of a tall dwarf as well. So <laughs> I kind of reside in the borderlands uh, in a lot of ways, and it's really exciting to to be part of these these two groups coming together. Um, I also a lot of you know I'm a filmmaker and um, I make images. Um, and, and bring stories to the screen that have to do with people whose bodies kind of push against and challenge um, social categories and stereotypes. I'm really trying to expand what's out there and what the images and stories that shape us and shape who we are and how we know ourselves. And I've been really dedicated to that for 30 plus years um, in both the fat and now the little people community. So I'm so happy to be here and uh, be part of, of, like I said, both of these groups. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Deb, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Uh, bear with me here. I've got 3,000 screens open. Here we go. All right. <laughs> So uh, Little People of America is an organization that was started in 1957 by actor uh, Billy Barty. He was uh, a really well-known actor at the time and uh, started the organization as a way for little people to come together as really there was uh, no other organization out there at that time like like Little People of America. So he started the organization and the first conference was uh, in Reno, Nevada. And I think 20 people, um, 20 people attended the first conference. And from there, it really, you know, took off and became this organization that we know today, which is over, you know, 8,000 members um, and in, really an international organization. Eileen, do you want to take us away? So one, so the mission of the LPA is improving the quality of life for people with dwarfism throughout their lives while celebrating the great pride of little people's contribution to social diversity. Also, our mission includes that we strive to bring solutions and global awareness to prominent issues affecting individuals of short stature and their families. I'm going to pass it over to Deb, and she's going to talk a little bit more about who we are and what makes up our organization. Great. Um, yeah. So, you know, Sam mentioned, you know, that we were started with with Billy Barty and, and from our very humble beginnings of 27 people coming together in 1957, we have grown to nearly um, about 8000 members now with that represent over like 300 different types of dwarfism. And our members not only are members, as I mentioned earlier, that um, are individuals who have dwarfism, but we also support the family members as our whole as our membership structure you know serves the entire family and their allies we also have a very strong medical advisory board 
Uh, there's about 32 professionals that uh, practice, their practice is primarily in skeletal dysplasia and dwarfism, and they participate in our organization as medical members. Um, we have, uh, we're kind of structured with over 70 local chapters all across the country. Uh, we're organized in what we call districts. We have 13 districts. And those individuals at the districts and at the chapters are really um, at, the, at the local level. And they come together to connect in person uh, with other people that have that, that shared experience. Um, our uh, districts usually will come together. You know, um, we have an annual conference that, that we're, you know, where folks will come together. And our uh, districts actually sometimes twice a year, approximately, will put on um, week-long kind of mini conferences that people can come together. And, you know, sometimes there's educational stuff, there's social, there's, you know, opportunity, you know, sometimes for the, for the youth and others to participate in some sporting events. And then we also have chapters that have monthly or bi-monthly meetings that bring people together. Um, many of those are social type events, you know, um, some of them are business kind of related, but th that is kind of the, the structure of what our meetings are. We, um, we have expanded our outreach. We connected with, um, it says here, 25 global sister organizations. Those are other organizations that support people of short stature or people with skeletal dysplasia in other countries. We have many of them that will, that are also members of our organization as international members. And many of them also come to our annual conference that we have every year. So, and we do a lot of uh, collaborative work with, with many of those organizations. We um, have our conference that I've kind of referenced a couple of times. Um, that our national conference is something that we have every summer. We've been doing that since 1957, except for the two years. Uh, during the pandemic, and even during during those two years, we held virtual conferences for a member. And um, this past one that we had in Austin in July had roughly about two two thousand attendees that came in for seven days. And we have activities planned during all seven of those days. Some of them are medical related, some of them are social related, some are educational conference or workshop kind of things. And um, we have events going from eight a.m. to to one a.m. in the morning. All seven days, so it's a it's a pretty um, powerful week, exhausting week at times, but very powerful, and something that our members, you know, who are able to come to that, really, um, you know, feel like that it's it's the highlight of their year to be able to come to our conference. We um, too many too many screens open right now. I'm trying to get all my notes. Um, a little bit about what we do. And, and I could probably talk for hours about all the things that LPA actually does. Um, we, we educate from the very beginning. LPA has been about providing education, uh, including medical information that we give our members, spreading awareness about uh, dwarfism, providing information to, um, you know, members and their family is continues to be our core. So we're kind of the go-to for new parents that are looking for information uh, you know, about a recent diagnosis of the, for their child, uh, when when they're working with schools or direction for medical advice, for adaptive equipment that they might, you know, need around the house, that we we have become the go-to organization for that. We also educate our, our members and families through our workshops. I mentioned that we have some of those at our annual conference, and we do some workshops even throughout the year on things, uh, new medical advancements, um, health, disability rights, employment, many of those are some of the topics that we provide educational content on. We're very uh, proud also to offer a scholarship program for our members. Um, this has grown um, and, and it grows through the, the donations of some very generous individuals who's, who help support our scholarship program. And for instance, in this past year, we, we award those in this, uh, the late spring. And in 2023, we were able to award $65,000 in scholarships to 45 students. And that's both for graduate and undergraduate um, students. We also have a couple grant uh, programs that we that we offer to our members. We uh, provide a grant for assistance to attend conference for those that are like first time attendees. 
so that they have the, the opportunity to kind of experience that magic of that one week um, that we come together. We also have recently started a new grant uh, for helping individuals with um, de devices or assistance with um, being able to improve their, their living independently um, op opportunities, so, such as being able to help uh, fund a scooter or a different mobility device, some adaptive um, you know, equipment for the home, uh, you know, pedals for, for driving, those type of things that can help um, assist with uh, more independent living. We also have an adoption assistance program. Um, this focuses on two areas of adoption that um, or two areas around adoption, I'm sorry. We help advocate for children with dwarfism who need a family. And then we also um, are able to provide some financial assistance to those that adopt a child with dwarfism with our uh, dwarfism financial assistant grants. So um, since the formation of our adoption committee, we've been able to be integral in bringing together 400 children with their forever families. And, and that's kind of a, a real passion for many of us, myself included. I actually went through the LPA uh, program to, to get kind of connected with our son. And if it wasn't for LPA, we probably never would have seen his, his file to begin with. Um, and then one of the other areas of, of focus for what we're doing is advocacy. Advoc advocacy kind of started as um, just awareness of dwarfism, but um, that has grown to be much more directed towards inclusion, equal rights, and combating, you know, overall ignorance. So um, that gives you a, a just a snapshot of some of the more important things that we do. There's a again, I could talk for days. So I'm going to talk a little bit about terminology. Um, one one quick story that I like to tell when we talk about terminology is when I was moving into my house uh, and moving into a new neighborhood. Uh, neighbors noticed uh, me and my uh, all dwarfism family uh, to that were moving in, um, and one neighbor ran over to another neighbor and said, "I know, I know what they want to be called. I know what they want to be called. They want to be called little people." And my other neighbor said, "Well, I'm just going to find out their name and call them that." And so, and it has ever been a, a funny story that we tell each other throughout the neighborhood. Um, so yes, of course, our names are always the preferred thing. However, we're going to talk a little bit about words that um, we we often use um, and words, of course, that we uh, uh, distance ourselves from. So dwarfism is the medical term um, to describe anybody who is of, uh, has any type of medical condition that um, results in their height being less than 410. Um, so some people often just shorten that word and use the word dwarf. To describe themselves, um, dwarf or little person are both uh, perfectly acceptable terms. Um, and then if you're down with the get down, uh, we we call ourselves LPs in our community. So uh, you could, you're you're welcome to use that uh, acronym as well. And then we will sometimes we'll talk about words like achondroplasia, hypochondroplasia, pseudochondroplasia. These are different types of dwarfism. There's over 400 different types. Um, so sometimes we'll we'll use these big fancy Latin names to refer to a certain type of dwarfism, um, but it all kind of falls within that umbrella term. And so the one word that we, well, I'm sure there's many words, but the one word that we definitely shy away from and we do not um, use within our organization is the term midget. Uh, we refer to that as the M word or the M slur. Uh, that is a word that Julie's going to talk a little bit more about as far as like the history of that word and how it came to be a word that we do not identify with. Um, so from there, I think I'm passing on to Julie. You're going to talk about our roots and entertainment. Yep, I am. And I, uh, you know, as the filmmaker uh, or maybe, you know, a, yeah, media maker in the room, I somehow didn't think about lighting and I'm sitting in the dark in my car. <laughs> I just want to apologize that you might not be able to see me very well, but hopefully you can see the slides um, and hear my voice. Okay. 
Um, so yeah, you've heard a bit about our origin story of, you know, Billy Barty being our founder. And so I just like to kind of think about the way that, you know, Billy Barty, an entertainer and screen actor, um, and someone who really embraced this role as a performer, um, was the founder along with some other, some other little people, actors. Um, these are some images pulled from one of the first conferences and you can see him, um, you know, embracing this role, playing the drums in a 4th of July parade. Um, and I just, you know, I find that history really telling about both the LP. Pre oh, and I don't know if, if Eileen mentioned the term LP, but I'm going to use LP as an abbreviation for little people, which we use a lot. Um, I find it really telling about like the, our LP present and future and also just so relatable to, but also distinct from the story of fat representation. So I'm happy to kind of share a little bit of that with you. Um, so let's see, you can go ahead and advance the slide, please, Deb. Um, you know, we have been pictured um, throughout human history. And these images on screen are all from, from Egypt. Um, at the top, it's female dwarf from 1700 BC, and below is an image that's really been embraced by the LP community of um, Sinab, who was an Egyptian um, high-ranking court official, 2500 BCE. Um, you know, the short way to say it is we've always been here and we've always been depicted. Um, and we can go ahead and uh, change the slide. You know, some of the some of that depiction gets into kind of what's more fraught about being a little person, and some of the roles that little people have um, been in throughout human history. So, um, you know, I wanted to share these because I've been researching and making art that intervenes in some of our more troubled histories, but also that kind of tells you about the legacies that we carry with us. Um, and sort of something that I think talks about the complexity, you know, these images, this one and a few of the ones yet to come get into both the the history that I think we we have a complicated relationship to sometimes owning and other times, um, I think, you know, like some of the terms distancing ourselves from. So. Um, uh, you know, this image is, is a, a Renaissance painting um, that it shows a pretty common gesture through a lot of um, European Renaissance paintings where you see a noble or a, um, a aristocrat with their hand on the head of their court dwarf. Court dwarfs were um, hired, but also sometimes bought and traded and sold to be in these positions as court dwarfs, sort of the entertainers, companions, servants um, in, in the court. So these were positions that were sometimes value, you know, it's 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 a real mixed thing about our, our these were coveted positions and also positions that were sort of some of the few good jobs and positions people at the time could could have. Um, we can go ahead and advance the slide into you know several hundred years later um, into a more democratized form of little people relationship to entertainment and being on display, P.T. Barnum, um, his first sort of claim to fame is Charles Stratton, otherwise known as Tom Thumb. And, um, you know, a lot of the sort of subtitles of his circuses were the, um, you know, kind of human curiosities. Um, and so we have this history of being, you know, in roles where we're put on display for our size, for our bodies. Um, and this is where we get to the, the M word, the word midget, which is, you know, as Eileen mentioned, a word that is, um, we don't want to be referred to because that word means it comes from the root of the word flea. And it's just a very diminutive, um, and diminishing, disempowering term. Uh, so, but there is a history, um, you know, early 20th century, late, late 19th century of troops that traveled and performed in vaudeville and sideshows. 
Uh, so, you know, one of the things that's interesting is um, this sense of um, adoration mixed with a kind of fetishizing and um, that kind of walks right into our life and status in the contemporary world and media. So go ahead and, and advance the slide, please, to, um, you know, just kind of thinking about this term that I, I sort of think about our presence as a kind of hyper visibility. So one of the things I know about, you know, fat representation is that fat bodies and fat characters are often invisible unless they're losing weight or being, you know, rep being represented in very particular ways. Whereas little people, as little people were all too present, all too visible in media. And again, in very stereotypical um ways that, uh, you know, I, I put a slide up here from Little Women. There's lots of reality shows that feature little people. And some of them, I think, are we, you know, generally a lot of people feel they are really positive representations and others kind of further this more exoticizing, fetishizing, um, sensational view of little people as magical creatures, as, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of feeding into a lot of these sort of negative uh, stereotypes that are very specific, um, often in groups, uh, not distinguished individually with agency and personalities. So um, go ahead and advance the slide, please. Um, wow, I feel like I'm like a professor giving a lecture. And I, <laughs> I, I, I get so excited about these images that I included a lot. But really, I just wanted to kind of talk about the way that images and um, our legacy in them shape how, how we live. And the, the thing that all those images that you just saw have in common is that they're views from the outside. They're views of, you know, an average height world, an ableist world looking at, at dwarfism and at little people people and bodies. So what do we do about that? Um, the next slide, if you would move on, um, kind of looks at ways that, you know, there have been, you know, not just recently, but in, in through history, but especially more recently images that um, sort of uh, both empower, you know, Peter Dinklage is, is someone who sort of really broke a lot of ground um, by being the most popular character on the most popular show on television, you know, a, a man with a chondroplasia whose character goes way beyond any consideration of his height. Um, you know, at the same time, he's been at the forefront more recently of critiquing new instances of LP misrepresentation and questioning whether uh, what it means to have um, a story, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, replicate this idea of um, dwarves as these magical creatures. Um, so, you know, there's been sort of controversy and conversation. And it's really, I think, unresolved in our culture at large about how, well, see, there you go. There's the term at large. Um, but our, our, our wider culture in terms of, um, wow, we can't get away from these size metaphors, can we? Um, you know, what we, um, you know, how we sit with these images, it can be problematic. Um, okay, I just have one more slide, which is, you know, um, I think what's sort of exciting and what I've seen is looking at artists, filmmakers, media makers, performers who are really um, creating different kinds of LP gazes. And the two top images are by uh, photographers, little people photographers, Ricardo Gill creates images that show the world through an LP height and perspective. Um, and Laura Swanson is also a, a little person photographer who, who you sort of, um, this image, it's a little hard to see, but it's like a bathroom sort of showing the built world and her almost invisibility in the mirror there. Um, uh, Mark Povinelli, our um, recent president, um, is also a, a really established actor who just acted in this amazing film, uh, The Return of Benjamin Lay. It's, I'm sorry, not film. I wish it was a film, but it's a play um, about Benjamin Lay, who was an abolitionist. Um, and then I used a slide from Kara Reedy's documentary, um, which we, Kara, unfortunately couldn't join us tonight, but she made a documentary, which you can see on The Guardian, 
um, called Dwarfism in Me. So I think it's exciting to think about how we're um, we're out there on the screen, and there's different uh, there's these really I think powerful interventions that are going on, and I'm also making work that I hope will contribute to that. Um, so I think that wraps up my what I wanted to say and share about LP history and representation. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. So I wanted to talk a little bit um, about um, mental health and also the concept of dwarf culture. Um, and I feel in this uh, section, we have a lot of um, overlap, you know, with uh, the experience of being fat in this culture. Um, and so I feel that there's a lot of meeting points um, in the experience. But um, as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, being, you know, other bodied uh, in our you know, culture in the U.S. Um, not fitting the standard um, in a number of ways, you know, both in appearance and physically and, um, you know, access uh, is a difficult experience and uh, definitely impacts our mental health and, um, and creates, you know, higher rates of depression, uh, possible suicide, um, people, you know, with disabilities, including people with dwarfism are at higher risk of, um, being victims of sexual assault. Um, you know, there's a statistic that, um, women identified people with disabilities are far more likely to have a history of, um, undesired sex with an intimate partner, which is like 19.7% versus 18.2% on average, you know? And so in all of those categories, you know, we represent higher incidence, higher risk, um, and, uh, just higher impact. Um, and you know, how that plays out for, our population, um, the antidote that often um, we try to support and create and hold uh, for our membership is community. And that is a big piece um, that I feel like NAFTA is also doing in creating community, creating support, creating um information sharing, resource sharing, and just, you know, an understanding around life experience that doesn't always happen within families. Um, the predominant forms of dwarfism uh, are show up as most typically as a mutation as opposed to a genetic um, inheritance. And so the most common experience for um, people with dwarfism is that they are the only one in their family to have that experience. And so it creates a situation where you have your family of origin and are understood in a certain way, but then have an experience that's very different than the rest of your family. And so having an organization of people um, who uh, can look like you and walk like you and have the same challenges as you um, you know, is, is obviously a really supportive experience. Um, and, you know, the whole idea within, you know, the evolution of um, disability and the concept of disability and dwarfism coming under that and coming under the ADA and, um, and coming under the whole idea of how we want culture to be was followed a similar disability justice path too with a medical model of like, how do we fix people? How do we cure people versus evolving into a more social model, supporting universal design and the idea of how we want the world to change and we want to embrace the idea that we are just perfect as we are. And how do we support people's um, ability to, to feel um, entitled to be in the world, entitled to pleasure, entitled to all the 
facets of life that that they desire. And so um, that's another big piece of uh, the antidote to to all of the the life experience that can come with it. And then um, additionally, more recently, you know, we've been trying to pay attention as an organization um, to all the multiple ways that, um, you know, oppression can show up for somebody within this positionality, even within the organization. If you have a type of dwarfism that is not well represented, um, that can create access needs. You know, if you use uh, mobility aids or a wheelchair, um, when the majority of people in the organization don't like that can create access needs. If you have multiple marginalizations, you know, if you represent a global majority, um, you know, or all the other like often quoted marginalizations in terms of sexual orientation, um, other disabilities, uh, you know, there's many ways that we are looking at um, how to support members on multiple levels and including, you know, we developed uh, another board position who the, the our um, other board position doesn't happen to be here, uh, which is the director of inclusion to try to look at, you know, how we're gonna support membership in all of these challenges. And so that's another way in which LPA is trying to um, address some of the ways in which we haven't always supported membership well. And, and so we're continuing to work on it that way too. So, you know, um, and, and also just, we're looking at uh, figuring out how we can address mental health issues more directly as well. And so that's, that's a little bit of that piece. So a good you know, number of us, including those on the panel here, are really, um, really love who we are and are very comfortable in our own skin. And so we, you know, are shifting, you know, I think Deb talked a little bit about advocacy and, and how we've uh, progressed the advocacy needle. You know, we have October, which is considered Dwarfism Awareness Month. Um, but we're, we're slowly shifting to uh, a Pride Month, a Dwarf Pride Month. Um, really because we are very comfortable in our skin and we are, you know, really proud of, of who we are and how we were born. And so really wanting to show um, the world that we, that we have a lot of pride in who we are. So Dwarf Pride is, is coming forward now more, more so than it has before. And we are, um, you know, we're we're taking advocacy more so in the in the moving the needle towards towards of a towards pride. Like any uh, disability, uh, there are folks <clears throat> that you know look to potentially uh, make some changes to who they are. So we within our own membership, even not not on this panel, but within our own membership, we have folks who have made the choice to um, have what. Well, it's called elective limb lengthening or ELL, where they've made the choice to, to go through a, a painful surgery and, um, and, and add some inches to their height. We also have, you know, other pharmaceutical or pharmace pharma, big pharma companies, sorry, that are um, creating drugs that are being marketed to parents of little people or people born with dwarfism. Um, in an effort to change height and to, you know, provide a quote unquote cure um, and, and help their child grow a little bit taller. Um, it's really a controversial subject within our community. And uh, it's a very personal decision that parents are making for their children. And, um, it, you know, depending on who you ask, it sparks a lot of controversy. Uh, we are a membership, though. We are a, a, an organization that is welcoming to all. So for folks that have made these choices, for folks that have not, we really want to be that membership that's inclusion inclusive of, of all decisions, even though it can be tough. So, um, yeah, next slide, please. 
And recently, as of last month, so Dwarfism Awareness Month or Dwarf Pride Month, Dwarfism Pride Month, we launched our new dwarf, Dwarfism Pride flag. Uh, so this flag is pretty, really cool. It's really important to us. And uh, we had some graphic designers within our community design it. And it represents who we are. So if you notice each green, green bar, like each green uh, yeah, bar, it represents a different type of dwarfism because we're a spectrum within our own community, over 400 different types. Uh, so each bar represents a different type of dwarfism. Uh, green is our color. D green is the color of uh, Dwarfism Awareness Month or Dwarf Pride Month. And the blue on the left represents, um, you know, our average size uh, families or, you know, the our allies. So the folks that really, um, you, you know, support us from all angles. So it's a really cool uh, flag and it's really something that we're really, really proud of and really proud to launch. Next slide. Oh, and so that's the end of our presentation. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions. No question is silly. Trust us, we've had it all. And um, we'd love to we'd love to answer some questions for you. So I do have a question that was submitted to us anonymously that I'm gonna go ahead and pose while <laughs> folks uh, other folks put their questions in. And just to, uh, just to let you know, those of you who are here with us live, um, if we run out of time, we will still collect the rest of your questions from the chat, answer them later on the NAFA Community Voices blog. So if you're watching this later on YouTube, you can look for that link in the comments, uh, in, the, in the caption as well. So friends, go ahead and put your questions in. In the meantime, uh, the question that came in directly uh, is, do little people find that they have legal recourse under the ADA in most cases, or are there times when the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, is not able to cover little people people's accommodation needs? It's a great question that I'm going to send out to my American friends here. Um, and I'll start with Eileen. It's a great one. I, yeah, I mean, I can start with that. Um, yes, so dwarfism is covered under the ADA. We can just make that, um, you know, to the blanket statement to start. Um, so, and I've, I've know of several cases where um, the ADA has been used in, in, advocating and protecting members of our community uh, and in various, you know, legislative or litigation uh, cases. So, yes, all together. I can tell a, I can tell a quick um, personal story is that uh, when my partner, who also has dwarfism and is a wheelchair user, uh, was in school, um, the ADA was, was new, a new law that came into place um, and his school had no curb cuts. Um, and had very limited accessibility within its high school. So the high school was told that they need to comply with the new ADA guidelines, and they they said they didn't want to. That it wasn't you know wasn't worth the the money to spend it on. Um, so uh, his his family advocated, and um, our our uh, uh, what was what was her title? Dang it, I forgot her title. Janet Reno. Um, was the one that wrote wrote her she herself wrote a letter to that school to say um yes you do need to comply and the principal of that school was outside cutting the curb cuts himself uh shortly after that letter was <laughs> was received so so what is, yes what, so as a follow up to that, what mm -hmm. can those of us who are not little people be doing in terms of physical accommodations to be better allies and make sure that you don't have to file an ADA, com uh, an ADA complaint in order to get your needs met? What are some of the things we can be doing in our daily lives to make sure that spaces are more welcoming for LPs? Yeah, I mean, I think that we could probably, you know, take up all night of thinking of some of those solutions. Um, so we can start with a couple. I mean, I'll start with some, and I'm sure that everyone here could have others to add to. But, you know, I always, if I go into a restaurant and all they have is high bar tables, um, you know, I'm not eating at that restaurant. You're not going to get my money. Uh, so so that's one thing. And Us too. Us too. <laughs> Different reasons. Yes. Yeah. Us yeah. Too. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, so, yeah. Just, are a big thing. Oh, step stools are a big thing. Yeah, hotels um, providing step stools. Uh, that's that's a big thing. I always make Washrooms. sure that it doesn't. 
on there. What did you say? Washroom? Washroom soap dispensers. Okay. Uh, okay. Paper Having bathroom, them at an accessible yeah. in, in 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 restroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. and if you, um, if y'all want to add other things while people are answering other questions, you can also yeah. put the suggestions in the chat and we'll capture that for the audience. Yeah. As well. um, I think my, my overall like uh, philosophy on that is that I feel that whenever something gets installed on a wall, so, like the soap dispenser or something, the person who installs it just does this and says, that's a good spot, which is usually well above the height that it's supposed to be. So just being conscientious of, where your arms reach out and touch the wall is not the place where everyone else is. So, so just making sure that that's in, in a, a different place. So, go ahead, Thank Iris. You. Thank you for addressing those. Um, a question from Carol, is weight loss, uh, are weight loss drugs and or surgery pushed on fat little people? So this is an interesting one because I don't, I don't know if it's pushed on little people, but weight oh, is definitely something that we have to be a little conscientious of because of our backs. And so we have to, um, you know, we, we, we just have to be conscious of it because it can impact our, our spines um, and our hips. So sometimes I, I do think the medical industry does push, you know, weight loss drugs and surgery on us um yeah and and i and i do know that the medical industry does talk about our weight a lot especially to children which is an issue yeah i think one thing is that our the medical community doesn't really know and have good guidance on yeah. on like you know healthy weight for for people of our size or of our stature of our body type uh, I know that I, like on my public health documents or, you know, medical records, it says morbidly obese on them. Um, and, but that's just because for my height, uh, my, my weight does not correspond, but you know, I'm, I'm a woman who's gone through puberty. Like it's like, you know, I'm not going to weigh the same as the, the size of a four-year-old. So, um, you know, my, my doctor sees that that's what's just automatically on there based on uh, my ratio. And even my doctor will be like, I don't know why it's on there, but I can't take it off. And and so it's just something that we struggle with a lot as far as medicine and and having and the right view. And yeah. Insurance, insurance yeah. and everything. Yeah. We, we know why it's on there, of course, because the systems are set up to utilize BMI, which is a flawed at yeah. best yeah. and, uh, and wrong. an ableist it's at wrong. worst tool. Um, yes. And so uh, that is definitely a place of uh, where we can have overlap as communities in terms of advocating for the elimination of BMI as a medical standard. Yep. Um, yes. And also thinking about, you know, when we, uh, for whatever reasons people may uh, desire to or be pressured to lose weight, the reality that we don't have effective ways to consistently help people lose weight, but yet we expect them to, right? Mm -hmm. That we hold individuals responsible to do something that we yeah. don't have a way to make them do. So with the, we have that dialogue in our community a lot, and we look forward to more cross dialogue in that way. Um, we do only have a couple of minutes left. Does anyone have a last thought about something that um, you didn't talk about in the presentation or we didn't ask you that you wish we'd given you a chance to talk about? I don't think I have a question that I wish you'd asked. Um, I always, I don't know, for some reason, Mr. Rogers always pops in my head and the idea of won't you be my neighbor, uh, won't you be our ally kind of always kind of rolls through my head. So, so always looking for allies, always looking for people that will, you know, um do something say something if something doesn't seem right and so now that you've you know, heard a little bit about us just being on the lookout and and joining our our community is something that you know we're always looking for folks to join for folks who want to follow you to learn more um you know we we've talked about um the possibility of more sessions together yeah. cross with our in our communities um but for in the meantime folks who want to learn more where's the best what's the best place for them to find lpa in all the places uh so um i'm gonna lean on 
Deb and everybody else, but uh, lpaonline.org for sure is our website. Social media as well, but I don't know the names of them. Well, our, our little Facebook, people of America. Little people of America. Yeah. 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 Little People of America is our Facebook and is also our handle on Instagram. Um, and you all have local chapters, right? So folks can find an, an actual local chapter chapter of LPA to get involved with as well. Yeah. And that's all on the website. Fantastic. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Julie, Rachel, Eileen, Deb, and Samantha from Little People of America. And thanks. Thank you, Tigress. Um, you are so welcome. We uh, look forward to talking with you more and continuing to collaborate with you. Thank you once again, um, as always, to our fantastic interpreters from Pro Bono ASL. They'll be back with us for more of our virtual events in 2023 and in 2024. Uh, so we will see you for um, our, if, if you are a fat identified person, we welcome you to our fat affinity space, Fat Friday's virtual social club, which is on the last Friday of every month. Um, all of our other open uh, events are open to people of all sizes, as long as they are um, are fat supporting and willing to show up as allies, accomplices, accomplices, co-conspirators, whatever terminology you prefer for the folks that um, that get beside us and support our work. Um, and uh, and that's it for tonight, folks. Um, we will see you next time um, here on the NAFA webinar series. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for having us.